Remember this, the AMD Threadripper. This one uh, was the 3960X and we did a build with this one. But the thing is, we've got a new guy, Ryzen 9 7950X, which absolutely kills this Threadripper in every single benchmark. And I'm gonna kill this segue to our sponsor. Looking for a cheap way to license your windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. So here it is, the Ryzen 7950X. This is the most expensive mainstream CPU. Okay, we're not going to be talking about the Threadripper CPUs or Xeon processors from Intel because they are for completely different use case and that's why it doesn't make sense to compare them with them. But this is $699 and is the most expensive one that you can get right now. And I'm super grateful for CCL Computers for providing me with all of the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs for testing them and creating this content for you guys. So huge shout out to CCL Computers. If you're in the UK, I highly recommend go check them out. I've personally used them for different things and it's my go to shop when I'm shopping for PC parts and I want to get them cheaper. They have always very good offers out there, good stock, good prices. Go check them out, links in the description below. One more time, thanks CCL for providing me with these CPUs. We're not gonna be actually looking at this Threadripper side to side, just because this third repair doesn't make any sense because this is so much more expensive and this platform is a dead um, you know platform so we don't need to look at that one but just a spoiler for you it would beat out the thread repair in every single benchmark or every single one of those applications here because the cores have improved so much and it's, it's much much faster so what processes are we going to compare in this video we're going to be comparing the 7950x from amd to intel 13900k 12900KS and 5950X from previous generation. The reason we're not going to be adding the 12900K in this platform or in this uh, section is because the 12900K is quite a bit cheaper at the moment. So the value would massively be in the benefit of a um, 12900K and 12900KS is more in the price bracket where this process aligns up with. When we're looking at the specs, then the 7950X has 16 performance cores where Intel has this hybrid architecture where it actually looks like Intel has more cores. For example, the 13900K has 24 cores, but it still has 32 threads. So the cores aren't equal, whereas AMD's cores are all equal. They can all be performance cores and boost up to 5.7 gigahertz, up to 5.7 gigahertz. But Intel had to beat that. Their cores can reach 5.8 giga. Hertz. The 12900KS can reach only 5.5 gigahertz and only has 16 cores and 24 threads. So we'll see how that stacks up with the 7950X. And the 5950X has exactly the same 16 performance cores. They're not the same, the previous uh, generation and can only reach up to 4.9 gigahertz. So we're gonna see how much has the new generation improved from the previous generation. Now you can see a lot of the specs on the screen and we could dive a little bit deeper, you know, in the cache and pay base power and so on and iGPU and so on. But the real difference is how do these perform in the applications which we're gonna be talking about in a moment. But when we are talking about the iGPU for the 7950X, I was expecting some kind of, you know, performance gain from there because Intel's iGPUs are absolutely killing it for video editing. But the sad truth is that the iGPU doesn't really do much and whenever you have a dedicated graphics card installed it always prefers the dedicated to graphics cards, media engines, decoders and encoders instead of the iGPU. So the iGPU really is only when you, make, I don't know, graphics card dies and you just want to have monitors still plugged in, get some kind of video output while you're waiting for that, kind of like a maintenance thing. I can't really at this point when I've been testing this, can't see any use of the iGPU so far, any extra use on top of the dedicated GPU, whereas Intel's uh, CPUs will have an extra use on top of the iGPU. Let's have a look at the pricing comparison here as well. So this is the highest end of systems that you will be buying. And here we're gonna be looking at the platform cost, the CPU, motherboard, and RAM 
cost because the CPU cost is one cost. Also, the motherboard is another big cost here. And the Ryzen 7000 series motherboards are more expensive than the Intel's motherboards from Z690 or Z790. Z790 is more close to the X670E motherboards. The X670E motherboards have more PCIe Gen 5 features like M.2 slots and so on. So uh, the price, they are more expensive, but you kind of get a little bit more specs for it as well. But in order to get onto the platform, there is the higher cost. And at this point in time, we don't have a lot of PCIe uh, Gen 5 devices out there. Like no GPUs, no M.2s. They will be probably coming out in a few months in a new year, 2023. But right now they're not available. So the essential cost looks very, very high for the Ryzen 7000. But at the same time, we need to talk about the future upgradability because the AM4 platform previously was supported like four or five years, which meant like four generations of upgrades like Ryzen 1000, 2000, 3000 and 5000 series processors, which is just insane. We don't know if AMD promises the same length for this, but I think for a lot of people, that type of mentality can be very uh, appealing to see a lot of future upgradability for this platform. So that means also if you buy the more expensive motherboard, you might be able to upgrade it a good few generations uh, in the future. Whereas on Intel, usually it's like two generations for one motherboard, two generations for another motherboard and so on. But the platform costs then. The 13900K is $70 more less expensive than the 7950X, which equates to 4.7% cheaper. The 12900KS is $120 cheaper and 8% cheaper. And the 5950X is $146 cheaper and 10% cheaper. But please don't upgrade to the Ryzen 5000 series processors right now because that is the end of the platform and all of the motherboards are getting very expensive. Even the CPUs are very expensive because there aren't that many available so like if you're looking at the same motherboard for example the x570 pro art then it costs more than the x670e sometimes just because it's not available which is just ridiculous because you're not getting any anything extra for it but we're looking at the percentages here if the Ryzen performs more than five percent better than the 13900k then the price kind of makes sense and more than 10% better than the 12900KS, then it kind of makes sense as well. So just like the pricing comparison. Now for the test setup, I was using the ASUS X670E ProArt Create a Wi-Fi motherboard for AMD. The Intel CPUs were using the same motherboard, but Z690 chipset. And for the Ryzen 5000 series, we were using the X570 Pro Art motherboard. For RAM, we are using two times 32 gigabytes DDR5 5200 MTS from Kingston Fury Beast RGB model that is. And the Ryzen 5000, we're using uh, 64 gigabytes the same Kingston Fury, but Renegade RGB at 3600 MTS. The GPU was exactly the same across the platform, which was ASUS TUF RTX 1390. The cooler for AMD was ASUS ROG Strix LC2 360 millimeter AIO with three Fantex T30 fans, just to limit any fan bottleneck for the cooling. So this is like the best cooling option we can give for the CPU. CPU. And for the Intel system, we used Fantex Glacier 1 360mm cooler with the same Fantex T30 fans, but they're exactly the same cooler, Acer Tech coolers inside, so the pump to cooling performance is exactly the same. And the Ryzen 5000 was using ROG Rougin 360mm cooler. For the OS SSD on AMD, we were using a Cardia C440, Intel was using Samsung 980 Pro 1TB version, and the Ryzen 5000 was using Cardia Z440 as well. The Project SSD for Ryzen 7000 was MSI M480 Spatnium 2TB model. For the Intels, we were using Samsung 980 Pro's 2TB model. And the Ryzen 5000, we were using 2TB FireQ to 5 30 from Seagate. The PSU for AMD was Corsair HX1000. For Intel, we were using the Deepcool PQ1000M. And Ryzen 5000, we were using Corsair HX1000 and 
as well. Now, a huge thing that does make a big difference for creators or very important thing for creators is the memory controller for these CPUs. And Ryzen 7000 CPUs actually have a very interesting quirk, which Intel also has, but is not as bad as Ryzen 7000. It's just a little bit better than Ryzen 7000. So when you have two six uh, of DDR5 applied or installed to your Ryzen 7000 series processors, it supports up to 5200 mega transfers per second at gear one speed. So the memory controller can run 5200 uh, megahertz. When you have four sticks installed, whether it's a rank, a dual rank or single rank, it drops down to 3600 megahertz. The 13th gen is actually improved by 400 megahertz at 5600 megahertz with two sticks and 4000 megahertz with four sticks and the 12th gen has 4800 megahertz with two sticks and 4000 megahertz with four sticks so basically what this means is that if you are using very high-end frequency in ram for example overclocked from the corsair or uh, kingston or something that's like 6000 or there's 7000 kits coming available now as well then your CPU or your system might not post with this XMP. It might not be able to run it just because of the memory controller. They're not running at gear one. Gear one would be the most optimum and stable uh, kind of system performance. If you run them at less, you know, obviously that's fine as well, but that might not happen just because your memory controller is not able to keep it up. And also if you have four sticks enabled, like if you want more than 64 gigabytes of RAM uh, in your creator PC, because most of the motherboards have four sticks, right? You put four sticks in there. Most likely you're not gonna be able to run them stable above 4,000 mega transfers per second. Now 4,000 will definitely work, but I have seen 4,800 work, sometimes 5,200 work as well. But there's so many different kind of variables that influence this result of four stick XMP. And I'm gonna go much more in depth about it in a different video to explain it all, why this would work. But just so you know, if you want to run XMP with four sticks, you're much better off with Intel's 13th gen rather than Ryzen 7000 series processor. But also it matters which motherboard you're using and which RAM you're using and which NAND the actual RAM uses as well. So all these things basically make a difference, but just so you know. Looking at the power consumption here, which this here is just like full speed if we have 100% utilization, something like Cinebench R23 rendering, how much power are we drawing this there? And I didn't apply any of the Intel's recommended values because, you know, Intel's on the website will show you that this is, you know, 253 watts at turbo power or something like that. But actually it's changed quite a bit because Intel now allows the turbo boost value to be uh, run like open or non-limited so basically these values have been tested when you pop your CPU into the motherboard like an Asus Pro ad here and um, you know press Cinnabon R23 out there to see what type of power draw it has and what type of score this is so this is what you can expect not like dialing in some kind of settings and really nailing it down because I think most creators will use the motherboard like this drop in the CPU and want to see how well does it perform because we don't have too much time like configuring and finding things out and tuning it and sometimes even losing stability with it we just want to pop it in have the most optimal and stable settings go how good is it that's the results you're going to get in this review as well the 13900k here is the most power hungry at 315 watts being pulled from the socket the 7950x pulls 232 watts and the 12900k is with its uh, 285 watts doesn't look as bad as the 13900k but still uses about 50 watts more than the 7950 X. The 5950X is the most power efficient here and actually is the best performance for what uh, in a lot of the rendering applications still. What this means is basically the 13900K is a little bit tricky, well quite a bit tricky to cool so I don't think you should be going with air cooling for that. The 7950X can be air cooled but the actual temperatures have changed as well. The motherboard and the cooling will allow the CPU to run as close to the TJ Maxx as possible which is 95C. And that's what you're gonna see in like 100% utilization. And Intel does a very similar thing. But basically, I think at this point of the kind of price point, you're just gonna be going with absolutely high-end coolers as well. So I don't think you're gonna be cheaping out 
the coolers here, but that's what the power consumption is like. Let's have a look at Cinebench R23, where we can really see where these CPUs kind of line up and where do these slot in, and you can compare these to your systems as well. The 3900K, the direct competitor with the 7950X, is actually 7.3% fast in the single core score and about 6% faster in the multi core score, drawing a lot more power as well. The 12900KS is actually 6.3% faster in the single core score but 22% slower in the multi-core score. So now we can see that those 16, you know, hybrid cores aren't as good as the 16 performance cores because threads come into the works as well. And the 5950X falls 20 to 30% behind in the single and multi-core scores. Geekbench 5, which is just showing the everyday kind of um, snappiness of the computer, a lot of different tests what you would do on your computer, but very shallow tests, what I would say, and CPU single and multi-core score only. Bear in mind, this over here doesn't actually count the threads of the cores, but only cores. So if your cores have multiple threads, like the Ryzen here, don't actually have an advantage here, whereas Intel has more cores, like 24 cores compared to the 16 cores, then Intel will have a little bit of a better benefit here. The single core is exactly the same on the 12900K S, 13900K and the 7950X. And in the multi-core score, as I mentioned, the 12900K S gets about 10% lead. The 12900K is about 5% slower in the single core score and 15% slower in the multi-core score. The 5950X is 25% slower and 26% slower respectively in the single and multi-core score. Now looking at a blender and this is like one of the favorite applications for AMD has always been and here again we are not disappointing the 7950X is the fastest in the bunch here and the 3900K is about 2 to 3 percent slower in every one of these scenes while drawing quite a bit more power. The 12900KS is 33 to 37% slower in these scenes. And because I don't have the 5950X benchmark for this Blender benchmark, I'm putting in there the M1 Ultra from Apple, which has 20 cores, so more cores actually. And as you can see, the M1 Ultra is 33 to 41% slower. So it gets quite a big, um, you know, defeat from the Ryzen and Intel sides, actually. So if you're looking for 3D, I think you're better off with a PC and the Ryzen 7000 series are very, very good at that. Not so much in the lower end, but the higher end, especially this 7950X is the best you can get. Moving on to Photoshop and photo editing applications. Interestingly here now, that the 7950X with the 16 cores is kind of clunky. The 3900K is about 10% better in overall score. 12900KS is slightly better as well, 1% better, but still equal performance. The 5950X is about 11% um, slower. So as you can see, the actual performance increase isn't that much in here. And if you have seen my Ryzen 7 and 5 and other Ryzen 9 reviews of the 7000 series, then you probably notice that the 7950X isn't that much better in uh, Photoshop than the 7600X. So if you are using Photoshop here, this 7950X kind of feels like a waste of performance because those 16 cores really aren't utilized and you're better off with a six or eight core a CPU if you're doing Photoshop only and you wanna go with Ryzen 7000 series. Looking at Lightroom Classic here, the 13900K is about 7% faster in the overall score. The 12900K S falls about 4% behind and the 5950X is about 27% slower than here. So in this Lightroom Classic, the 7950X is very good performance, but the 3900K is still a little bit better if you're wondering like who wins the race. Moving on to video editing and firstly here Adobe Premiere Pro. And here is the point where the 7950X is just not as impressive as the competition, especially even the price point. If we're looking at the increase from the previous generation, then the 5950X is only 4% slower in the overall score. The extended export score, yes, is 17% slower and the standard export is 14% slower on the 5950X. But look at this. The standard live playback here with 167 is actually 31% faster than the 5950X, which just makes me wonder whether the Adobe Premiere Pro was sometimes utilizing the iGPU for this benchmark and not getting as good results as 
uh, when using like the, the dedicated graphics uh, media engines from the 1319. The 13900K and 12900KS do absolute destroying of 7950X in this application. The 12900KS is about 16 to 23% faster in the extended and standard overall scores and the 13900K is 23 to 33% faster in the standard and extended overall scores so much much better for this so in this application i'm not as impressed with the performance and the previous generation 5950x does still that good of a job that if you're running that system already i don't see a point of upgrading to 7950x i'd rather upgrade to like 13th gen of intel just because that will give you quite a big of a, an increase but still not enough to really make the jump at least for me adobe after effects here we can see that the 5950x is about 20 percent slower in the overall score and that is like a good generational increase about 20 percent better is good but the 12900ks is about one percent faster overall really really tie to tie with the 7950x and the 13900k is about 13 percent faster than the 7950 X. So another application where Intel might be a better pick instead of the Ryzen 7000 series. Now DaVinci Resolve and here we see interesting things. The 7950X is very very good competing against the 13900K and the 13900K is only like 0.4% faster by the way. These are just not single benchmarks. I'm running the benchmark like five to six seven times and I'm doing the average of this so that's why 0.4% faster will really it does mean 0.4% faster. In real world, you won't feel it in exact this application. In terms of percentage, it is correct. The 12900K is, is about 7% slower and the 5950X is about 27, 28% slower or 30% slower in the standard overall score. Now, I do want to mention again that this benchmark does not test the timeline performance of different codecs. So if you're using H.264 or 5 codecs, then the Intel iGPU will give you much better timeline performance because these media engines there are much better at playing back this footage. So if you're using that type of footage, then Intel will have a little bit of a benefit over there. And no, even the RTX 4090 won't have as good encoders or decoders inside as the Intel iGPU, the UHC 770. The only benefit that the 40 series NVIDIA graphics cards will have is that it can support AV1 native hardware encoding. So if you want to like export your video to AV1 from DaVinci Resolve, you can do that. Moving on to V-Ray, the last 3D application then. And here again, this is the sweet spot, the bread and butter for Ryzen processors. The 13900K is 7% slower, 12900KS is 33% slower, and the 5950X is about 31% slower. So then, conclusion, is this Ryzen the 7950X a good processor, and would I recommend this for creators? I think this processor here is for 3D creators. If you're looking for the best processor for 3D, then that's the one. And compared with like something like the RTX 1490, and you're gonna get insane 3D performance from the graphics card and the cpu and sometimes you can utilize them both together as well so that's absolutely amazing in this i do see a little bit of a lack of creator performance or create applications um, kind of emphasis from amd on these cpus and they mostly want to market these for gaming cpus because as you can see compared to intel this is much more expensive and it doesn't perform as well as the 13900k and the 12900ks is cheaper and keeping up a fair bit with this 7950X. So to see this price difference, I'm not seeing that type of performance increase, which just makes me a little bit like, hmm, I'm, I'm expecting slightly more from this 7950X. To me, another disappointment was the iGPU. I was hoping for something more from this AMD to put a little bit more emphasis on this to help us, you know, get some kind of support for this. But I do think there can be some future support from this by working with software and drivers to utilize the media engines in there as well. I'll have to do a, a proper test how good these media engines in there are and if they're even worth, you know, utilizing because your DGPU might be much better at that. The good thing is that we probably can expect good uh, platform compatibility with this platform. So you might be able to upgrade quite a few times in the future for the same 
price point. But if you are running like the Ryzen 5000 series platform with a 5950X, is it worth upgrading to this one? Honestly, not really. Don't spend the extra money and go with this one. Wait for the next generation upgrade for this. And if you're wondering what about the, you know, 3D cache that can come up with, you know, this processes, most likely AMD is going to do a refresh. I think that 3D V cache is still like mostly for gamers. If you're looking at the creative applications there, we haven't seen that big of an improvement in there. So in the top tier of things, I do think Intel has an edge for the 13900K. But at the same time, the 3900K is very hard to cool down and very often can thermal throttle, whereas this one might be very much more appealing to you just because of the only 250 watts or something like that that it pulls from the socket. Now, what would be perfect with this CPU is if AMD lowered the price a little bit. It needs to drop the price about $600 or 650 at least 50 to 100 dollars for it to look really really appealing for people because right now What is it 699? That's a lot of money and a lot of new upgrade or platform cost to get Not that much of an increase over the competition But I'd love to know what you guys think in the comment section below Please do check out the latest pricing for this CPU in the description below if you wanting to pick this up Or if this looks like an interesting CPU for you just because at the time when you're watching this the prices might be completely different So check them out in the description below and also if you want to build yourself the best bank for book create a PC Then I've got build guides in the description below go check them out They're there you can get the best PC for your money the best performance for your money check them out down there thanks guys for watching and i'll see you in the next one bye bye